Silicon Valley investor, computer security expert, and entrepreneur who spent 15 years and 250,000 to hack his own biology. He upgraded his brain by 20 IQ points, lowered his biological age, and lost 100 pounds without using calories or exercise. Financial Times calls him a biohacker who takes self-quantification to the extreme of self-experimentation. He's written for the New York Times, Fortune, and spoke at Wharton Kellogg and UC uh, California and Singularity University. He has a BS in Computer Information Systems from California State University and an MBA from Wharton. I'll give you Dave Astor. We're going to go through the Bulletproof Diet today. The Bulletproof Diet is something that I've been working on for a very long time to increase my own personal resilience. And backing it up are about between 1,000 and 1,300 studies that we use to put this into a form that we use to increase fertility. We're publishing our book in December with Wiley. The book is actually about what to do before and during pregnancy to cause epigenetic changes. But the nutrition plan and all the research that went into it applies to everyone. I've used this to lose, oh, 100 pounds and to increase resilience. So we'll talk about 14 reasons that the Bulletproof Diet works, different, different ways of looking at what you can do to metabolism to sort of hack yourself to take control of your biology. And then I'll actually talk about the diet itself. The diet itself is a little bit small it's for projecting. You can go to bulletproofexec.com and you can download it for free. It's a printable thing that goes on your refrigerator. And there's no cost or anything like that. But in order to give you the information uh, for you to sort of take notes on the individual foods and what order they go in, it doesn't make sense. So take a deep breath. Don't worry about writing all of that down and I'll, we'll publish the video on the website and we're streaming live as well, I think. Are we streaming live? Yeah. Hey, everyone listening? Yeah. Pretty soon we'll have them able to ask questions too. We haven't wired that up yet, that's on the list. If you know how to do that, send me an email. Can you guys see this okay? No. No? I, I could turn off the other light, but then the video is going to be really poor. Um, this room is in Well, I think. We can see it. We can see it. Well, no, right. So, you can read it at least. This is an improvement. So, what we're, what we're talking about here with biohacking is it's an art and it's a science, and the idea is that you can take control of your biology and you use data. This isn't just how do I feel, but it's what do I do to measure how I'm performing. And things like big data, big data is a recent thing that's part of cloud computing, what I do for my day job as a vice president at a company called Trend Micro. What we're doing with big data though is we're taking massive data sets, the sort of things that only NASA would have had 20 years ago, and we're saying we can apply that just to you, to look at your genome to look at a whole bunch of lab markers, to look at how often your heart beats, and to look at the spacing between your heartbeats. And all of that gives you information that was completely unavailable to you in all of history. What you get out of this is essentially, you can be stronger, you can be faster, you can be smarter. And I'm serious when I say 20 IQ points or more, it's absolutely achievable by pretty much everyone out there, and it doesn't take as long as you would think. It's hard. How about adding younger? You, you could add younger to it, but I don't know. I, I think, you know, as I age, I get sexier. I mean, is anyone going to disagree? <laughs> what you really get to be is resilient, and resilience is part of being younger. So, excuse me. Hey, guys, it's getting kind of louder. That's okay. So we're talking about resilience. There's one little thing, the fine print, and if you can't read that, it says, at your own risk, you guinea pig you. So if you're going to be a guinea pig on yourself, you may get ice burns on 15% of your body, like I did, but you also may experience profound increases in what you can do as a human being, and that's really cool. So the, the diet is one part of biohacking. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got here. This is me when I was 20-something, uh, early 20s, I had all the symptoms of Asperger's syndrome, including OCD, ODD, uh, nerve sensitive nervous system, uh, inability to remember names, make eye contact. I was really socially awkward. I stuttered, not super bad, but enough that it bothered me. I had 297 pounds when I was studying computer science. I started biohacking myself. 
This photo is from Entrepreneur Magazine. I was the first guy to sell anything over the internet. I sold caffeine t-shirts to 12 countries to pay for my computer science degree. Um, it was either me or the guys who started Wine.com. Like, I'm one of those guys who does it 10 years before everyone else. And that's the actual photo from the magazine. Four years later, well, I worked at University of California Santa Cruz Extension in the evenings. I ran the web and internet engineering program. I also uh, had really amazing amounts of stress because during the day I worked at the company that basically invented cloud computing. It's called Exodus Communications. Google, Hotmail, Yahoo, all of them put their first servers in our building to use our network. My brain started to misfire. I made $6 million. That was kind of nice when I was 26. But I was getting cognitive dysfunction. That was a real problem. And I used a program called FreeCell. How many of you have heard of FreeCell? So if you've used Windows for a while, it's the free solitaire game that comes with Windows. And it turns out if you play it regularly, you know how you perform. And I noticed some days I perform really poorly. Some days I perform really well. Therefore, it's not just me. This is an outside of me measure of my internal state. Because maybe I just thought I was tired. Maybe I wasn't. So I noticed I was getting really highly variable performance in how my brain worked. And I was really bothered by it because I actually bought disability insurance. I said, I can barely work the whole day. I'm so tired. I don't remember whole meetings. So something's going on. So I'm still really fat. I maybe lost a little bit of weight, but the seventh grade people were right. I actually was getting stupid. <laughs> so I started hacking my brain as well. <coughs> 10 years, quarter million dollars later, I, I've had a very fortunate career. I've had a chance to work at a venture capitalist on Sand Hill Road. I've twice run strategy for companies with more than a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, I'm a spokesperson for a billion dollar company right now, Fly Around. Uh, I've had a, just an amazing career. I've been an angel investor. My book's coming out soon. I have two wonderful kids. This number is wrong. This month, 90,000 people read my blog. It's now one of the top 25,000 websites in the US, um, which I'm amazingly grateful for, given that 18 months ago I hadn't done anything. I'm about 210 pounds, depending on whether I decide I want to stand on a vibrating plate and add a pound or two of muscle or not. I'm smarter, my vision's better, my hearing's better, my memory is better, and my energy is way better. Here's how I did it, at least part of it. The diet part of it. I wanted to get a diet that wasn't just about losing weight, because when I weighed 300 pounds, I worked out six days a week, I ate 1,800 calories a day, I did that for a year and a half, 45 minutes of cardio, 45 minutes of weights. I couldn't lose the weight, it just wouldn't come off. And the notion that you're gonna tell your body that you're in a famine, which means low calories, low fat, and there's a tiger chasing you, which means doing cardio and lifting weights every day, relentlessly, six days a week, is not actually a way to lose weight. It's also not a way to build a resilient person. It's a way to break yourself. So I wanted to be more resilient. I wanted to be able to withstand things that I probably couldn't do when I was 18. In fact, I had arthritis in my knees when I was 14. I was diagnosed with it. So I wanted to be younger than I was when I was young. I wanted my brain to work all the time, even if I was tired. I didn't want to have to worry about losing weight. I didn't want to age. In fact, living forever seems like a decent idea. <laughs> and eventually, we built fertility into this, because fertility is one of the best ways of measuring how you're doing biochemically <coughs> and epigenetically. In fact, if we had a good way to measure, say, sperm motility, mm -hmm. you could track what you're doing this week, as a man anyway, and you can look at what the effect of that would be on the quality of your semen. So it turns out that people who are fertile and have regular cycles for women and have normal libido for both sexes, uh, that that's really important. That's part of being young and resilient and powerful. And you need bacon. It's a part of the diet. The first reason it works is that it tastes good. I have a blog post about why bacon actually isn't bad for you if it's properly processed and it's properly cooked. It has some healthy fats in it. It turns out, if you want to have a diet that works, denial is not the way to do it, because you're going to be doing this for the rest of your life. If I'm going to deny myself for this one month. Well, then two months later, you'll be fatter. <laughs> We've all done that. If you've ever tried dieting, cutting calories, it's not the way to do it. So denial is a bad idea. Eating good stuff is pretty easy to do. Not eating good stuff is hard to do. I and mean, this isn't rocket science yet. <laughs> when you get cravings, eventually, during a moment of weakness, you'll probably give in. If you don't have cravings because you're getting all the nutrition you need, then wow, that works much better. You'll be satisfied if you eat food that tastes good, like bacon. If you eat good food, 
you'll be happy. If you're happy, you'll do more good stuff. It, it, this is like the most obvious slide ever, but whoever thought of grape nuts with skim milk didn't get this. I'm sorry. If you want to feel crappy all day, you have that for breakfast. <laughs> the other thing here, just dealing with hunger. You don't want to be hungry. If you're hungry all the time, you're sending yourself signals that you're in a famine. We have the caloric restriction genetic stuff you can do. We heard about Benagene, there's metformin, there's also intermittent fasting. There's other ways to get the genetic effects of caloric restriction without actually being hungry all the time. Because you do get cranky, your catecholamines go up, and your quality of life goes down. You also, when you're hungry, you're not kind. You don't think well. You open your mouth without thinking, and you say things that aren't nice. It turns out if you just eat moderate protein, you get less hunger versus eating, say, grape nuts. If you eat a lot of healthy fat, including butter, you actually feel full between meals. If you eat high real nutrient density, you'll be full too. By the way, real nutrient density includes water and fiber. When you go to Whole Foods and they sell you on nutrient density, they forgot to mention that that high nutrient density spinach is mostly water. They're selling you the most expensive water ever in the, those vegetables and not very many nutrients. Vegetables are still good for you, but they're not high in nutrient density. They're low nutrient density because they're high water. Meat, that's high nutrient density. Regulating hunger hormones. Hmm, works. I think I have a typo on that, that's annoying. The idea here is that if you regulate your hunger hormones, you don't feel hungry and eating properly does that. And we'll get into the details on why that works. You need to reset your leptin sensitivity. That's actually a picture of leptin. Leptin resistance, if your cells are unable to respond to the hunger hormone called leptin, you will be fat, and you will get weaker, and you'll be tired. And most of this, the claims in here have numbers after them, and there's studies that I put on the website that talk about this, so I'm not just making this stuff up. Leptin-sensitive people are the opposite of leptin insensitive people. When you increase your leptin sensitivity, you are more resilient and you tend to be lean naturally. Turns out, if you're getting to be insulin resistant, you're already leptin resistant. Your leptin sensitivity goes away before your insulin was. So if you're approaching type 2 diabetes, you're pre-diabetic, you already have broken on your leptin, you need to reset it, and you can do that with a bulletproof diet. If you have high, dry, high triglycerides, which are a major problem when you eat fructose and lots of carbs, you will develop insulin sensitivity. I'm picking up a vibration here. You got it? And if you're eating one of these kinds of foods, you're going to get leptin resistant. It's amazing. They can make these things. And the FDA lets them say smart dogs. There's no dogs in here even. It's all vegetable protein. <laughs> Terrible. So these are basically like not food. You eat this, you're going to get leptin resistance. Leptin is a hunger hormone. It's, you, have, you, you have insulin in your body. This is one of the other things. This is one that signals you to be hungry and signals fat storage. So by controlling this with the things in the diet, one of the reasons the diet works is because it does control your leptin. And if you eat the way we're talking about here, your body will learn, your cells will learn to be sensitive to your leptin levels again. And so you'll manage your hunger very effectively. You'll also have more energy. So it's wonderful hormones in your body. The, the comment, your doctor won't know what we're talking about. A few of them will. In fact, the kind of doctors in this room will. So there's a big difference. So not all doctors are bad. Many of them are good. In fact, I'm married to one. She's good. How many of you have heard of VIP? Which stands for vasoactive intestinal peptide? I'm guessing almost no one. One? Oh, you got dinner with me last night. <laughs> Two, three. Okay, a few people. It turns out this is really important. This is one of the reasons the Bulletproof Diet works. This hormone, or peptide, controls some brain function. It controls how you sleep, how your gut works. If you have gut problems, this is part of it. And it generally controls your metabolism. If you have inflammation, this is one of the things that may cause it, especially if it's environmentally triggered inflammation. If your leptin's off, your VIP will be off. But if your leptin is working, your VIP may still be broken. And this is an important, different thing that causes inflammation that many people don't understand. The Bulletproof Diet addresses VIP. If you have toxins or stress in your life, your VIP levels can be off 
And this is one of the reasons that stress affects your gut. VIP is the way it works. And it turns out eating high amounts of healthy fats without toxins in them allows your VIP to work. If you don't have VIP, you won't have enough stomach acid to digest your food. What? Your sound is overmodulated. Yeah. What should I do? You need to turn the modulation down. Should I use the other mic? You can try that. It is on this side of the room. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't get it. Is this better? Still? Oh, I thought it was just feedback. This is good. Turn me up a bit. How about now? All right, we're good. If I do this, you need to tell me. I'm pretty good about not doing it, but sometimes it still happens. So it turns out, if you avoid toxins and you get your leptin levels reset, your VIP improves, your gut improves, and your inflammation levels go down. Controlling inflammation is really important. There's also something called autophagy. This is a picture of a cell doing autophagy. We mentioned autophagy briefly with the Benagene presentation that Alan presented earlier today. This is a process that your cells use to clean themselves out. You have lipofusion, you have other things, and there are things you can do to trigger your cells to clean themselves. You really, really want to do this. You take a shower, you need your cells to do the same thing. There's a study I referenced there that you get accelerated aging from these things. You want anti-aging, you want to be young for longer, you need to do this. Autophagy gets rid of the gunk, keeps your muscles up. I went two years on five hours of sleep and 4,000 calories a day without exercising, and I grew a six-pack during that time, and I posted a picture of it on my website. I'm not saying that everyone should do that, but what I'm saying is that those things are possible. This is, I'm a guy who was formerly obese. I have stretch marks when I was obese. So if I can do that, someone who doesn't have all the health problems that I started out with can definitely do that. That's an example of what we're capable of. And maintaining muscle mass without exercise is absolutely possible if you pay attention. You can reduce the effect of aging by using out of aging. The way you get this, you go into ketosis, which is something this diet does, which means you go into fat burning mode. There's a protocol on the website called Bulletproof Intermittent Fasting, where you avoid eating in the morning anything except for fat and coffee. When you do that, you get profound effects on muscle and fat levels, and you get the benefits of autophagy. One day a week, you restrict protein. You don't eat any protein one day of the week. That can have profound anti-aging effects in just a couple months. And you can also do exercise if you so desire. I'm not opposed to exercise. I'm opposed to excess exercise, which most people do. Most people now overtrain because they believe that they're good people if they exercise every day. Bile turnover. How many people have heard of bile turnover as a measure of health? Also, a couple people. This is one of those random things. But it works. Your bile clears the toxins out of your body. This is what you use when you're digesting fat. It's a signaling molecule within your GI tract. You don't absorb your vitamins, like your vitamin D, your vitamin A, without bile. If you don't have bile, you basically have bad digestion by definition. If you get more bile, and you excrete more of the bile, so you basically create more, it's like taking the dirty oil out of your car. If you do this right, you'll be much better off. If you eat a high-fat diet, you avoid toxins, you'll have much more bile turnover. There's a study about that, and when you do that, you'll be healthier. Those are the names of three types of toxins we'll talk about in a minute. Controlling inflammation is terribly important. Chronic inflammation is Stress, pathogens in the gut, food toxins, which are a huge problem in the American diet. Environmental toxins, which also affect the way you digest your food, and just being fat. I have a guy, one of my clients lost 75 pounds in 75 days on the kind of protocols we're talking about without any significant amounts of exercise. So it turns out being fat is something you can fix within usually 60 days, even if you're really, really obese. So you just don't need to do it anymore. Here's the thing about food toxins. Lectins, which are common in food, the, di the diet, the infographics that I'll show you, automatically help you avoid these things. Lectins will damage your gut. Wheat is a major source of it. The nightshade family, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, for a lot of people cause problems. One of our audience members was just telling me that by avoiding lectins, her symptoms of MS magically went away. 
Maybe it wasn't a mess in the first place. It was algae and lactose. Phytates make you unable to absorb minerals. These come from eating legumes. Gluten is bad. Mycotoxins are one of the areas where I spend a lot of time researching. Mycotoxins come from our environment and they come from our food. Small amounts of moldy food get blended in with lots of non-moldy food because of our industrial manufacturing processes and those hurt you. Does that mean we should avoid mushrooms? I recommend that people avoid all but medicinal mushrooms, at least at the beginning of the diet. And there's actually really good research, even those normal white ones you buy that are canned, the very common button mushrooms, cause smooth cell wall proliferation. So there are pretty good reasons to use them medicinally, but not as a food source. There's a little bit of a, a problem here. Some toxins are useful for making your liver stronger. And vegetable defense systems are there to keep you from eating the vegetable and keep bugs from eating the vegetable. Those are toxins, but some of them can make your liver stronger. A lot of what we are told are nutrients for us are actually things that are there to protect the vegetables. They're toxins that make us stronger. So you don't want to avoid all toxins, you want to avoid the toxins that make you weak. Toxins from food processing are a big problem. If you use barbecuing, you're going to get toxin formation. If you heat your meat to over 300 degrees, or ideally even 325, 350, you can get away with, you form HCAs. If you grill, you get these PAHs. Friday makes advanced glycation end products. You cook your polyunsaturated fatty acids, you get oxidized oils. So I recommend you cook your food carefully and with consciousness. Lower levels of heat, shorter duration cooking, and a little bit of liquid or even a little bit of antioxidant on it. When you do that, the meal becomes far less inflammatory. Less inflammation equals less spare tire and better thinking brain. You can also test. Don't eat any of this stuff for a week and then have a nice big juicy grilled steak that's charred on the outside and look at what it does to how you sleep. Look at what it does to how you feel. Look at your breath in the morning and see if you can't tell. You can. Biogenic amines. How many people know what a biogenic amine is? A, a small percentage of, of the audience. How many people know what histamine is? There we go. That's one of the most famous biogenic amines. You have lots of histamine, you're going to have problems with allergies. Did you know that protein breakdown in food, especially certain types of food and certain types of breakdown, causes histamine to form in the food? Day-old fresh fish that wasn't frozen has huge amounts of histamine in it. And there are other things like putrescine and spermidine that cause similar problems. Histamine is a major stimulating neurotransmitter. That's why if you take Benadryl, it knocks you on your butt <laughs> because your stimulating neurotransmitters got turned off. But if you eat something, say a bad cup of coffee that was processed improperly and is full of histamine, you will have negative effects, including potentially headaches, including inflammation, including hives. This is in a lot of the food you eat. It affects these things, your hormones, your hunger, your metabolism. You eat something and you're craving, craving more food, soy sauce, full of histamines. It makes you eat more. These things cause headaches, they make you nauseous after you eat, and they can make you think you have allergies when you don't. These are the names of some of them. All of them are toxic in excess. There's studies like that forever. One of the biggest sources of this is fermented food. So we've all been told, eat your fermented soy. Fermented soy is the second highest source of biogenic amines out there. It's not good for you. It simply isn't. Even if you don't have a strong response, you have a robust histamine digesting system using an enzyme called DAO, you still are not doing yourself any favors by exposing yourself to that. Fermented fish is even worse. The, the fish sauce from Asian food is not something you should choose to eat. And my lovely Swedish wife shouldn't eat that really stinky Swedish spoiled fish dish either. <laughs> sauerkraut? It largely depends on what fermented sauerkraut, what species did it. Was it a biogenic amine forming species of bacteria and yeast? I can tell you which ones in capsules form biogenic amines in the gut. It's a major problem with probiotics you can buy today. Most common brands have Lactobacillus plantarum and Breve, both of which cause biogenic amines to form in the gut. I accidentally gave my kids some and they had hives for two weeks afterwards because I didn't read the label well enough. Oops. So this is a major issue and I'll actually, I have a, a big piece on biogenic amines and probiotics coming out on the blog soon. You also want to be in frequent ketosis. Less than 75 grams of carbs, 
If you eat MCT oil, which is an extract of coconut oil, you can tolerate more carbs and still stay in ketosis. On the podcast that I run, we actually had a physician named Mary Newport, not Enid, Newport, uh, who cured her husband's early onset Alzheimer's using MCT oil from coconut. If you're in ketosis, you have more blood in your brain, more oxygen, more toxins can be removed, your neurotransmitters get better, your heart works better, and if you go in and out of ketosis on a regular basis, you'll be a higher performing human. I also tell you, limit your fructose. Basically, fructose goes to your liver, it's treated kind of like a toxin, like get it out of here, raises your, tri your triglycerides, gives you gout potentially, it's much more likely to form these advanced glycation end products that cause oxidant or that cause higher levels of oxidants in the body. It cross-links with your collagen, causes skin aging, and one of the things I like to do, but I won't because the chair's over there, I can put my head, my ankle behind my head um, without warming up or anything like that. I turned 40 this year. Wow. And that's in fact I should just do it when I'm yeah. Just because I'm trying to make a point here about eating collagen and not eating fructose. Let's hope my jeans work. What was it like before? Before? I couldn't touch my toes for the first time in my life. I weighed 300 pounds and I was not flexible at all. I was the guy in the soccer team who you know, couldn't do the things. So this is from eating a clean diet. I've also taken some enzymes and other things that break up scar tissue, but I haven't done yoga in a long time either. Fructose gives you oxidized LDL. And I wish you'd get more. So keep your fructose to less than 50 grams, and ideally even less than 25 grams a day. I eat very little fructose. By the way, did you know blueberries have more fructose than bananas? No. They do. I eat raspberries instead of blueberries if they're not moldy. Healthy gut flora matters enormously, so you need to support that by eating a diet that's not full of toxins that kill healthy gut flora. You have 100 trillion bacteria in the gut. They're really responsible for some of your energy balance. You will be in a bad mood if you have the wrong bacteria in your gut. You will have huge amounts of inflammation if you have the wrong ones. And you'll get leptin resistance if the wrong things are going in your gut. If you eat toxins, you will have bad bacteria in your gut. It's almost unavoidable. Your immune system will stop working as well as it should. And if you're highly stressed, your bacteria get stressed. They pick up on that, and they get stressed by the environment around you. So if you eat things that make them stressed, then they respond by pumping out toxins. That's what all microbes do when they get stressed. They protect themselves, just like we do. This, if you can't tell, is my daughter. And this is... <laughs> Absolutely. Carrie Gold, grass-fed Irish butter. She got that for Christmas. First time she ever sat on Santa's lap. She said, what do you want for Christmas, little girl? And she said, I want my own stick of salted butter. <laughs> And he looked at me like, oh my god, you're an abusive father. <laughs> and I said, yeah. So he said, yes. And she had a bicycle and all the toys. And that was her favorite. She picked it up, she opened it, and she held it above her head like an Olympic torch. And she ran around the house screaming, yay, butter! Okay. So my kids eat butter on a regular basis because it's good for their brains. And there's a lot of that science in the book. I eat a stick of butter a day on this diet on purpose. By the way, micronutrients are kind of funny. A recent study, I reference it here, if you wanted to just get the USRDA, which is completely jacked anyway, you only need to eat 27,000 calories a day. So yes, this, this lovely vision we have of getting all of our nutrition from our food, yeah, good luck with that. If you're not getting the right nutrients or you're eating toxins, you're going to lose more nutrients anyway. The bulletproof way we do this is you eat nutrient-dense foods. Butter is a highly nutrient-dense food. So is liver, so is beef from grass-fed animals. You don't burn your food, and you pick foods that don't have toxins in them in the first place because they're quality foods and because they're the right foods. And here's the philosophy behind it. Most people don't know what it feels like to feel awesome. You might think you know what it's like to feel awesome, but it's like being colorblind. If you've always been colorblind, sure, I can see the color red, it looks like that. And you really do think you see the color red because you've never experienced it. The Bulletproof Diet is actually presented as a spectrum here, and you'll see the spectrum in the next couple of slides. And that spectrum will allow you to choose to be as clean in your diet as you possibly can be, and when you do that, you'll experience profound improvements in, in brain fog and cognitive function, 
in energy levels, a very common sort of feedback I get after someone goes on the diet for even just a week or two is, oh my god, I feel like I drank jet fuel. I feel so good, I'm sleeping an hour less per night, not because I can't sleep, because I don't need to sleep to recover, and my brain works. I've gotten so many things done, I've become more creative. This is what your body's capable of, and you don't know what's getting in your way. So you just remove all the things likely to do it, and then you can learn. You need to find your kryptonite. So for someone over here, it might be gluten. In fact, for almost all of you, it's gluten. <laughs> but, Someone over here may really tolerate casein quite well, milk protein, but for many other people that might be one of the things that makes them weak. For others it's nightshades. Other people it might be nitric oxide in, in food. There's many different things. So I went through over the years and pulled out all the stuff that research shows is likely to cause major problems. Said now you can eat as clean as you want and then you can go in the other direction. So if you want to be able to feel dirty, you have to feel clean first or you'll never know. Once you find something that really messes you up, you've not had it for a week, you try it, you, you fall down when you're done with whatever it was, well, now you eliminate that and you can go back and test the other things because there's multiple variables here. So maybe your problem is if you eat a spice you're allergic to and dairy together. Well, you find out you're allergic to a spice, you stop eating the spice, maybe your dairy allergy just got better or vice versa. So it's a constant process of building awareness. If you become self-aware of the effect of your environment on you, your environment becomes a deliberate thing that you choose rather than something that happens to you. And that's why the Bulletproof Diet is so profound, because it builds mindfulness of what your food and what the world around you does to you. Now we get into the specifics of the diet. It turns out, how many servings should I eat per day? Healthy vegetables, I'd say six to 11 servings. These are FDA servings, which are sort of dumb because ketchup is a serving here. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Healthy fats, five to nine servings. And those servings are relatively high calorie, obviously. Animal protein, a good amount of protein. And one to two servings of fruit. So fruit and vegetables is like fish and bicycles. They're not the same thing. So in your mind, you need to separate them out. So that you can say, I'm going to eat a fruit. A fruit is a bag of sugar water. It's a candy. And it has some vitamins in it, too. It really does. And a vegetable has a very different effect on the body. So just to divide them up. How should I allo allocate my calories per day? This is fruit. <laughs> up to 70% healthy fats, at least 50%. This is really important for a whole variety of reasons, including ketosis, including cognitive function, including the bile turnover. If you say, oh, I'm going to do the bulletproof diet but low fat, you will fail. Animal protein, approximately 20% of your calories, and a whole bunch of vegetables. Vegetables are mostly water, but they're not that many calories. Now, things that really mess you up. Starch, sugar, processed foods. I almost said feed these to your mother-in-law, but that wasn't very nice. So. <laughs> Grains and soy are simply bad for you. And milk and cheese, there are a whole variety of reasons you shouldn't have those, but butter doesn't have the downside that's present in milk, which is both milk protein and toxins from what the cows ate that accumulate in the protein and very specifically in the cheese. This is how the Bulletproof Diet looks, and I'm hoping this is visible. Can you guys read these at all? No, I can sort of, yeah. Good. So what we do is we say green, red, you're on the Bulletproof Diet even if you say, you know what, today I'm going to have pastured duck. I could have been more perfect, but let's face it, if you spend your entire life trying to be more perfect, you probably can do it. You can make sure that the walnut you ate was blessed by a one-armed monk, so it's slightly better than it was before. There's a law of diminishing returns. So you don't have to only eat the perfect food all the time. What you do is you say, if I'm sitting down at a restaurant and I see a menu, and I can eat factory farmed eggs and meat in a quiche, or they have over here, say, a smoked sockeye salmon. Well, now you have a map that tells you if I choose this, I'm going to be more bulletproof than if I choose this. But if I choose this, I'm still on the bulletproof diet. I just chose to eat on the red side of the bulletproof diet. Every meal is a combination of choices, and this is just a roadmap to help you make better choices. What we focus on over here is animals that have less polyunsaturated omega-6 oils. And very specifically, we recommend grass-fed animals, because grass-fed animals have a very different fatty acid and a very different toxin level than factory farmed beef. In fact, if you notice, 
Factory farmed meat is here. Grass-fed beef and lamb is here. It's that big of a difference. I can't stress that enough. If you're going to go to a restaurant and you're going to order something that's not wild or grass-fed, you want to get the leanest possible thing you can get. Usually the filet mignon is a good choice. And you want to do that because that fat from those animals is the wrong kind of fat and it's full of toxins. And if it's not organic, it's full of synthetic xenoestrogens that they put in the animals. <coughs> People who believe in the calorie myth don't know what to say when I tell them ranchers buy something called Xeranol. It's a waxy tablet full of an extract of toxic mold that you put in a cow's ear. It melts into the cow and they pick up the fat and this estrogen increases feed efficiency by 30%. What this means is the presence of a tiny waxy tablet in your ear meant you had to eat 30% less calories to get the animal fat. You still think that it's calories in minus calories out? It just isn't. And that's only one of many things that affect whether a calorie makes you fat. In the middle, we put pastured duck and goose because even though they're pastured, they're still full of fats that aren't fat compatible with humans. So they taste good. I eat geese and ducks, but I don't eat them every day. I don't eat them as health foods, and chicken breasts are not high on my list of health foods. From an oil and fat perspective, we're looking for saturated fats, that don't have toxins in them, and we're looking for omega-3 oils. And we're trying to avoid omega-6 oils whenever possible. So we pick coconut and MCT oil, which is an extract of coconut. Non-GMO soy lecithin or other sources of lecithin are important for forming good nerves. No other part of the soy is useful to eat. Even this one may have allergy problems for a few people, but it's usually okay. Olive oil is good. If you think you're going to eat all olive oil and be healthy though, you're not. Eating too much olive oil is going to give you too many omega-6 oils, but it is one of the healthy oils, and it's one you should never heat. Chocolate, cocoa butter, you can eat as much of that as you want, pretty much, as long as it's not moldy. Avocado, or avocado oil from avocados that was not heated, is also a good source. And we go into some nut oils that are somewhat polyunsaturated, and you get over here to you know, GMO grain oils like corn oil and <coughs> margarine and fake oils. This is one of the most important slides. If you simply <coughs> drew a line about here, and said, actually you can draw it here, and said, I want to go in that direction, you'll profoundly transform your health. Eating the wrong kinds of fat will mess you up. Now I'm going to talk about secret butter powers. I need a t-shirt for that, like a butter stick. That would be awesome. There's something in butter called butyrate. How many of you know butyrate? Cool, we have like a butyrate aware audience. My son, who's two and a half, looked at me the other day and said, Daddy, why do I need more butyrate? Uh, so, <laughs> awesome. so, it's a short chain saturated fatty acid. Short and medium chain saturated fats act very differently than the long chain saturated fats we're used to hearing about. In humans, this is what butyrate does. It's anti-inflammatory. In fact, in the brain, it's profoundly anti-inflammatory. One of the reasons people go, oh my god, I just woke up, when I have Bulletproof Coffee, which is the recipe on the site of mixing unsalted butter and low-toxin coffee, blending it instead of using cream in the coffee, so you get more butyrate. People who do that go, wow, I feel better than I have before in years because the butyrate and the caffeine together, butyrate stops brain inflammation and so do some of the compounds in coffee. So suddenly, their brain works better than it has in years. So you get this anti-inflammatory effect, you inhibit inflammation. It's a profound <coughs> healing part of the gut. Sorry, not part of the gut, but it has a profound healing impact on the gut. You can get it from dairy, 4% from cultured grass-fed butter, or goat butter is 5% butyrate, or if you're lucky enough to have intact gut flora of the right species and to eat the kind of fiber they like, you can grow butyrate in your gut itself if you eat a high-starch, high-fiber diet, but you may fart a lot. <laughs> in mice, it's shown to protect against mental illness. I believe it does the same in humans. It also makes you burn more calories and improves body composition. You get leaner when you eat butter because butter is 4% butyric acid. That's awesome. You put butter on your food. No vegetable should ever be without butter. <laughs> Also, butyrate reduces the negative effects of type 1 diabetes. 
your intestinal permeability, which allows intact proteins through for your immune system to attack to give you food allergies, also goes down. So your gut will heal if you eat more butter. That sounds crazy, but it's true and it works. You get thinner and you get smarter when you eat butter. Now I say that one without a study. I'm working with Stanford and Yoni, a guy from Google, on doing an IRB approved study of the effects of grass-fed butter in low-toxin coffee versus no butter and regular bad coffee. So we're actually going to have data. I would ask you, if you're interested in being a part of the study, it'll be two weeks where I send you some coffee and you drink really good creamy coffee in some mornings and not other mornings, I would love to have you participate. So if you're interested, hit me up on Twitter, I'll give you my email at the end of this, and it would be really cool to have your help. Let's talk veggies. Vegetables are good for you, right? Not necessarily. Notice, like, fruit is over here, <laughs> and vegetables are here, and some fruits are better than others. And here, for instance, eggplants, peppers, tomatoes are in the middle here. They're not particularly good for you because they're full of lectins. Lectins are responsible for, I will say responsible, lectins are proteins that go through your gut lining intact. They stick to the polysaccharides, the sugars that line our cells. Different lectins stick to different cells in your body. Lectins are the defense mechanism from those things. They're there to keep bugs and animals from eating those vegetables because they're, they're poisons. Serine nerve gas is actually based on a lectin from jack beans. This, these are potent things. 20% of all arthritis comes from, not garlic and onion, but eggplants, peppers, tomatoes, and potatoes. But here potatoes are even worse than here because of their starch content. Garlic and onion are here, which makes a lot of people very upset. But I like garlic, and I like onions. And that's okay, I like them too. But particularly garlic is a medicinal herb. Dosing yourself with garlic all the time is not a good idea. How many of you here are Italian? How many of you know Italian housewives? There's a stereotype there. And I'm not saying whether it's true or not, except that, well, it came from somewhere. Uh, what I'm saying there is that there are studies that show garlic inhibits alpha brain waves. So does onion. It has an unstable nitrogen bond in a molecule that's relatively similar to THC. And EEG studies will show you that you have a harder time entering a relaxed mental state when you eat garlic. I've done advanced neurofeedback training, 40 years of Zen meditation in seven days. Not that I learned all the stuff you learned studying that, but I did achieve the same brain state of someone who spent time every day of their life meditating. If I eat garlic, it takes me four days to be able to get back to having my brain do what it can do. When you train your brain using the kind of software that we have that, that teaches you to be smarter, same thing, a quote from my business partner, Dave, I didn't believe you about garlic, but now that I train my brain to do the dual impact training that raises your IQ, for him it raises 18 points. So if I eat garlic, I, my brain doesn't do what it can do. You lose abilities if you eat garlic every day. If you eat this every day, you will never know it's doing that to you because it's in all the food you get at every restaurant. So go without garlic for two weeks and see how your meditation changes. Over here we have vegetables that are healthier for you. And over here, we, you can go this direction. Artichokes, higher in starch. We start hitting extra starch and extra fructose and we get into the very high fructose over here and high corn syrup at this end. So it's not that you shouldn't eat canned fruit. If you do, you're eating something that's on the red side of the bulletproof diet, not on the green side. You made a less <laughs> optimal choice, but you didn't fail. Nuts and legumes. Nuts are over here, coconut is by far the best. The next version of this diet that comes out, we come out once a year, once every six months with the latest things. We're actually going to shift these a little bit to the right because of concerns about the last couple of years, the number of toxins that are in nuts. They seem to have been going up. This is uh, reflected from drought and weather conditions for the most part, but we'll shift these over a half inch. You won't notice much difference. These are some other things you can do. And you get over here garbanzo beans. I'm sorry, hummus is not the new guacamole. Hummus is not that good for you. It's relatively high in omega-6 oils, and it's very high in lectins. Pick the guac, not the hummus. Grains. Oh. <laughs> There's not a lot of them over here. <laughs> this is actually an old rev of the slide, and I should have put the right one up. White rice belongs here, and this one belongs here. White rice has less toxins than brown or wild rice. They're both relatively good for you as far as grains go. You get quinoa and oats. If you're gluten sensitive, you don't want to even do those. And after that, you really don't want to be eating this stuff. This is not bulletproof food. From a dairy perspective, butter and ghee, non-organic, grass-fed. It's a question of what the animal ate. That's what controls almost everything to this side. And you get here and 
past this, you're basically into, you really ought not to eat this stuff. Pretty much all cheese is over there. The reason cheese is there is that most of the toxins from what the animal ate get concentrated in the cheese, and then we ferment the cheese. When we ferment the cheese, we basically put some microbes on it, and we say, here, enjoy the cheese. Now, the thing is, microbes like to protect their cheese. They don't like to share with other microbes. So um, we've all heard of Roquefort, the cheese, right? Have you heard of Roquefortacin? That's the toxin that Roquefort makes to protect its cheese from the other things that try to eat the cheese. So there's a little microbial warfare happening on the cheese. So in addition to taking all the toxins from what the cow ate and dumping it into the cheese, then we allow a little war to happen and then we eat it. It tastes good. I'm not, not doubting cheese. You know, quesadillas are wonderful. They're just not very bulletproof. So I actually have some recipes on the site. I don't know if I posted that one, but it's written where you can make things that are cheese-like that don't have cheese in them, that taste really, really good because you use the butter fat. You still get the fat from cheese, but you replace the rest of it with vegetables. Why was skim milk there? Skim milk is there because they, in order to make skim milk, remove that butyric acid and all the healthy fat. Then they spray dry the milk, which oxidizes what cholesterol is left in it and denatures the proteins. They get powdered milk from that. They add it back into the skim milk. Skim milk is gross. Like, it is not food that humans should eat, especially kids. It is not healthy. Eat, drink water before you drink skim milk. In fact, I'm not sure if Coke or skim milk, which I think I would pick Coke. <laughs> I'm not joking. Now, when you eat spices, this is a huge, huge issue. Spices are full of biogenic amines, and mycotoxins are a known issue, a very big one. A huge percentage of spices globally are lost to mold infestation. So they take spices that are not that moldy, but are known to have the species that generate the worst toxins, like ochratoxin and aflatoxin. And they say, well, the levels of these species are very low, and we can't irradiate these because people won't buy them. So we're going to just package them up. And then as good consumers, we take the spices and we put them in the cabinet above the stove where the steam goes. And then those spices, they keep getting moldier and moldier. So that paprika you haven't opened since you cooked last Christmas or something, when you open that thing up, it is going to give you a headache. I'll bet you money if it does. One of the easiest things you can do is toss your spices, move them out of the kitchen or at least away from sources of heat, and keep them very carefully sealed. I know people keep theirs in the freezer even in jars. I like to do that. And what I've done is I found that things like oregano and turmeric, in particular oregano is a great replacement for garlic. If you put enough oregano on something, you really don't miss garlic. So I focus on apple cider vinegar and these spices here. And you can, I'm a gourmet cook, you can do amazing things with these things. You don't need to have a spice blend with 85 different spices. Spice blends are almost always lower quality spices and they quite often have MSG in them. In the US, if it's less than 75% MSG, you can label it as spices. You can label it as flavor extract, spice extract, and many other things. So. If you have problems when you go to restaurants, quite often MSG is a hidden culprit, and they will tell you legally, no added MSG, but they put a pound of three quarters MSG in there, but they didn't have to tell you legally. So that's just a scam. That's why spices, flavorings, MSG are there. How about chili peppers? Chili peppers are tough. Where do I have this here? Like the really spicy ones. Um, I love super spicy ones. How could they not be here? <laughs> My favorite ones. I like to cry when I eat. Chili peppers. I grew up in New Mexico. Like really, I, I powder my own habaneros. They're relatively good unless you're lectin sensitive. If you're sensitive to lectins in chili peppers, they may cause significant problems for you. So you need to test them. Go down for a while and then add them back in and see what happens. <laughs> lemon juice is fine. I didn't count it as a spice. I guess it's a flavoring. It would be over here. Lemon juice is totally okay. Lime juice is awesome. I use it in some of the recipes too. Isn't apple cider vinegar um, fermented? Apple cider vinegar is fermented, but it doesn't form biogenic amines when it ferments, and it doesn't form mycotoxins. The only thing that you need to worry about there is if it's organic apple cider vinegar, you can form patulin, which is one of the mycotoxins that's really bad for your kidneys. So it turns out organic apple juice has 5,000 times more patulin than non-organic apple juice, but that's okay. You're probably still okay because the fermentation process with the acetic acid reduces passion levels a good amount. I drink organic apple cider vinegar. I don't just drink it, but I use it in my, my as a seasoning to bring the sour taste in. What about coconut vinegar? Coconut vinegar? I don't know. I haven't seen any good studies on it. Um, I would just use apple cider because it's a better study. Balsamic? Balsamic? 
full of lead, usually, and oh, full of microtoxins. Bad news. Sorry. Tastes good. Not good for you. I didn't see millet on your grains scale. Millet would have been one of the grains kind of three quarters of the way towards the red. Thanks for bringing that up. We'll have to put that on the next one that comes out in a couple months. Red wine, red wine vinegar is depressing. Red wine vinegar is pretty bad. In fact, I should have put that in an alcohol infographic. It's not in this presentation, but I actually ranked the alcohols from least toxic to most toxic. Red wine is the second most toxic. Red wine vinegar is not a good choice. Uh, I hate to say this, all of the the least toxic is uh, potato vodka that's distilled and filtered. Kefir? It's a fermented dairy. It's, some people do really well with kefir, but a lot of people don't. So you also need to use raw milk to make kefir if you're going to. So it's a, I would call it a risky food, but it may work for you. It's worth testing. Go with that for a little while, add it back in, and see if you get an egg. Other questions? Egg whites. Egg whites? Egg whites are tough. Um, if they're raw, they have avidin. Avidin blocks the biotin in the yolk. So what I typically do is I eat some raw egg whites, and I just use more egg yolks. So I have a recipe on the site called Get Some Ice Cream. And when you eat this, it has nine <coughs> egg yolks and two or three egg whites. So the ratio of yolk to white is proper, and it's raw. It has a stick of salted <coughs> butter, coconut oil, a sweetener, which we cover in the next <coughs> one of these. I use xylitol or erythritol, uh, and some vanilla. When you, when you make this, an hour after you eat it, your body gets an epigenetic signal that says, I am in a land of plenty with enough saturated fat to support neurological development of a baby. It's time to mate. Which is why it's called Get Some Ice Cream. <laughs> if you're dating, the idea of, hey, let's, let's have a drink, versus I made this ice cream for you because I think you're so awesome. Trust me, the ice cream's a better fat. <laughs> Seaweed. Seaweed's good for you. Uh, seaweed actually would be a nice addition there. But the seaweed salad they sell at sushi places has gluten in it from the way it's processed. Mm -hmm. So nori is okay, but seaweed salad in the U.S. is not okay. It was the Google chef who taught me that. I'm what? curious how you might reconcile something that I've been studying. The people in the longevity hotspots routinely eat fermented foods. It's one of the things that is similar in the diets of all the longest lived people is they eat fermented foods not just every day but pretty much like with every meal every day. This is a major a major thing. In 19, roughly 1980, DuPont released something called Benomil. Benomil is a antifungal that's used on crops. We used it pretty heavily. There was concern that Benomil kills 98% of fungus the other 2% though, it's a very potent mutagen and it causes plasmid level mutation, not single gene mutation. So it's not evolutionary style mutation, it's X-Men style mutation. And plasmids can be traded like baseball cards between species. These things reproduce every 20 minutes. So for the last 30 years, we've been breeding super toxic molds. And when you put that cabbage on top of your fridge, you don't know what's in it. So the chances of you getting much higher levels of mycotoxins or much higher levels of biogenic amines goes up dramatically. I'm not saying all fermented food is bad for you. If the food is properly sterilized and it's fermented with the right strains, it can be very health promoting. But since you don't know, and so much organic fermented food has excess histamine in it, it's totally a crapshoot. And that's why I tell people avoid the fermented foods and then add them back in. Do the get clean and then get dirty thing. And if you feel great on fermented foods and you know your digestion's stronger, you feel really good and you're still full of energy, great. I think you may find that it's not consistent. This week I felt great, next week I didn't. And if you do the experimenting, you'll find out that fermented foods are not as good for you as they used to be. We also have a problem where Roundup spraying on top of this fentanyl creates 500 times more toxins from soil microbes. What we've done is, first we ruined our own probiotics in our guts, so we don't have a good gut flora here. And now, thanks to things like vegan diets and vegetarian things and this whole idea that you know grains are good for you, We've done the same thing to the planet's probiotics, which is our soil ecology. So we're basically destroying our soil with these chemicals, the equivalent of taking an antibiotic for your own GI tract. We're using these fungicides in fields. We're sterilizing soil. So those are the reasons that you're having problems with some fermented foods. The other thing is that when we want to create, say, a, a new chemical, we can use a bioreactor. We take aspergillus usually, and we genetically modify it, say, maybe to make citric acid as its toxin instead of you know, one of the other ochratoxins or something. Then you put some sugar, put some aspergillus of your special stuff in a big steel vat, and you let it ferment for a little while. 
as it ferments, it makes more citric acid, which is what you're trying to make. But it doesn't make enough. So what do you do? First thing you do is you shake it. You stress it. After that, you expose it to EMFs. Hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. You piss it off as much as you can. And the more angry and threatened it gets, the more toxin it makes to protect itself. When you're fermenting that stuff in your house sitting next to your wireless router, I think there's probably an effect from that. I also think there's a reason that in Korea they bury the stuff they ferment. We fermented it in root cellars 100 years ago. Are you doing that now or are you doing it on top of your fridge? It matters. We know it matters because it's a manufacturing process we've done for a long time. I'm not saying all fermented foods are bad. I'm just saying the fermented food you're eating is probably bad unless you do it right. We have fish oil uh, on the safe side. However, high levels of fish oil on the trees are inflammatory. What is safe? Question, how much fish oil is safe? One, two, maybe three grams. A lot of people excess dose fish oil. I actually prefer krill oil. Um, on the blog I read about krill oil as a phosphorylated source of omega-3s. Excess omega-3 can be a major problem because it oxidizes. <coughs> saturated fats don't oxidize, they're stable. Your cell walls, your brain, your hormones are mostly made of saturated fats with enough omega-3s to allow flexibility for receptors to express through the cell wall. And even the notion of a cell wall is a bit funky. It's not really a cell wall, it's two layers of fats. It's called a lipid bilayer. Having the right fats there is important. That cold exposure that I mentioned earlier helps to change that. The bulletproof diet, though, by itself, really changes your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Some people have a 40 to 1 if you eat a standard American diet. 40 omega-6s for 1 omega-3. I have 1.5 to 1. And that's about where I'd like it to be. Question over here? You know, the doctors who treat diabetes <clears throat> prescribe metformin. Metformin affects your liver. Is that a positive effect or a negative effect on your liver? The question is, when you have diabetes, doctors prescribe metformin. Is it a positive effect on the liver or a negative effect on the liver? My research, I, I took metformin for about four years as an anti-aging substance. My understanding is that its effect on the liver is usually okay if you're taking your vitamin B12, because it does deplete B12. So you'd want to take B12 with it. And taking metformin in that way gives you some of the genetic changes that happen as a result of caloric restriction. It was a biomarker pharmaceuticals who did a bunch of research in rabbits to show that it actually causes genetic expression changes. It's pretty cool. There may be an argument for doing it. I know people who do it. I just found I didn't really need to do it. My fasting blood glucose is 89, even though I eat a stick of butter every day and a pound or two of red meat. And uh, exercise is something I do for 20 minutes once every maybe 10 days. That's all I need. I'm a little inflamed because of the ice stuff now. But like seriously, like this is like food. Like this is like I'm not the most ripped guy I've ever met. But I'm happy that I flew 100 times last year. I'm the vice president of a big company. I do this. I write books. I have little kids. I don't work out for an hour a day. It's a total waste of your life. How I felt and based on research and just looking at what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the fermented food thing, I would say, if it works for you, great. It's fun. It's part of artisanal cooking. I eat local. My freezer right now has seven grass-fed lambs and half of a grass-fed cow in it because the good grass was just out in Victoria, so that'll last me for a while. Uh, so I'm all over the local make-it-yourself thing. Just don't do the fermented stuff until you've tested without them and you know what clean feels like, then add fermenting back in and you may find you do even better. You know, maybe your gut function is going to be awesome. You may be surprised at your results, and it may change with every batch, and it may change with the age of the batch and how the batch was stored. And now I'll sound like a total hippie. It may change based on the phases of the moon, because it turns out that the phases of the moon actually do control the toxin levels in microbes to a certain extent. It matters. Like they're part of the they're part of the ecosystem around you. You're saying you should have fifty percent of your food. Uh, fat, healthy fat, and you know, a lot of the products from calories. 50% of your calories, right. Calories. But um, how, how does that work? A lot of the fats, like saturated, I'll tell you, it's really bad for you. But it works and like that. Omega-6. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you get your omega-3s? Uh, <laughs> omega-6s, how do you get it so low? That's very low. Usually it's 3 to 4 to 1. But yours is how do I get mine so low? I don't eat omega-6 oils. What do you in your fats during the day that you're getting this healthy fats? What I, do for, <laughs> what I do for breakfast is I have bulletproof coffee. I take this, which is, I actually designed the, the process to make this coffee to not have amines and not have mycotoxins in it. 
Um, people who are allergic to coffee usually can drink this. They're not allergic to coffee, they're allergic to mold in coffee or they have histamine problems. So they drink this and they're like, oh my god, I feel so much better than I have in years. Because coffee's an adaptogen. Coffee, I have a whole talk on coffee, but it does really positive things for your brain. It even helps to fight brain cancer if you brew it right. So I take this and I brew about 400 uh, milliliters of it, a large cup. I add about a quarter of a stick, maybe a third of one of these of Kerrygold to it, a big squirt of medium chain triglyceride oil, and I blend it so it has a big head of foam like a latte, and I have that for breakfast. And I'm completely full and I'm completely focused and I feel awesome between about 7.30 or 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. I don't need anything else. I enter ketosis during that time because I had a fast all night long while I was sleeping. And then around 2 o'clock, I'm like, wow, it's time to eat. If it's my one day in 10 where I'm going to work out, I might work out for 15 minutes standing on a vibrating plate holding a barbell or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go eat. And I eat a pound of meat, vegetables blended with more butter, stuff like that. If you have a shake in the morning, did you add weight protein? If you have a shake in the morning, if you're not trying to do bulk or intermittent fasting, yes. Whey protein matters, but whey protein is very fickle. So I recommend grass-fed, undenatured whey protein concentrate. I'm not trying to plug my stuff here. I formulated a whey protein that has the highest levels of immune-stimulating, glutathione-making things in it. It's called Upgraded Whey. It's on the site. Um, it's been like getting very, very positive reviews, and it's just like it's what I give my kids when I get my. You gained fifty percent of your calories from that diet you just gave us. Fifty percent. I get all my calories from that diet. <laughs> from fat. From fat. You, from that diet. You Absolutely. Just gave us, you get fifty percent of your Actually, I get close calories to the from. Uh, yeah. Just put butter on everything. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I do it, and I feel sixty-eight percent, and it's easy. I do it, and I feel sixty-eight percent. Oh, <laughs> what was your question? Because in grass fed butter, it's almost one to one. Are you saying how do I keep it so low? Because grass fed butter does have some omega six in it. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay, so well, I don't eat any other omega six oils. I eat some fish. <laughs> what, are um, oils? what? What? What are the omega six? Canola oil, corn oil, vegetable oil, like all the stuff on the red side of the oil. I olive just oil don't eat this. I don't eat much olive oil. <laughs> I, might, I might have a tablespoon of olive oil every couple of days. What about nuts? Nuts are there on the diet. Some nuts are worse than others. I have like walnuts further to this side because they're the highest omega-6. Yeah. And the way you process your nuts matters too. You want unheated nuts particularly. So um, I don't eat a ton of nuts. A lot of people on the Bulger diet do, and they do well. It depends. Nuts are also a higher risk of mycotoxins. So it, it's one of those things that's kind of, you have to look at your individual biochemistry. This was the last one I forgot to hit the sweet one. A lot of people in the paleo diet camp will tell you, get used to not eating sweet food. Sweet tastes are bad. That's not technically true. I recommend xylitol. Um, erythritol also should be here too. Those are the two safest sugar alcohols. Stevia, which tastes horrible to me, but uh, I have a gene that about 20% of people have where stevia tastes bitter and awful. The rest of you may love it. The other sugar alcohols, alcohols here do raise your insulin a little bit. They may kick you out of ketosis. They're not great, but they're better. <coughs> Table sugar is much better than brown sugar, which is usually far more full of toxins. It's less filtered. Or, um, what do I have sucrose here? <laughs> this is, oh. This must mean organic. I have to fix that to say organic. Regular white sugar here is really not that good. And you get into corn syrup, NutraSweet, and these artificial sweeteners. These are really important. If you care about brain function, just don't eat that stuff. It, it's really not good. Even acyl sulfate and potassium, which a lot of people say, oh, that's the safest one. It's linked to benign thyroid nodules. In the mid-90s, I ate a lot of acyl sulfate, sulfate and potassium, and actually grew the nodule in my thyroid that comes as a result of it. Just, you don't need fake sugar, so that's all is fine. And raw honey is not something you should eat every day with breakfast or something, but a little bit of raw honey before bed can have a profound effect on sleep because it raises your glucose in the brain specifically. You can even stay in ketosis if you have just a little bit, like a teaspoon or two. What about green tea? Green tea is really good for you. And I should have something about drinks here, like low toxin coffee and green tea are both really good for you. Green tea, um, to a certain extent, coffee to a larger extent, and chocolate all inhibit mTOR. mTOR is something that your body uses to build muscle. And the way you build muscle is by inhibiting mTOR, and when you stop inhibiting it, it springs back. When it springs back, you build muscle. So if you drink coffee, you do intermittent fasting, or you drink green tea, or you eat dark chocolate, 
and you time it right, you can actually use that to just build muscle. It's the same stimulant that exercise is, except you didn't have to exercise, you got to eat a chocolate bar. <laughs> you could do two of the three, like intermittent fasting with coffee. Wow, you had a good morning and you maybe grew some abs. Can you quickly explain the correct timing? The correct timing? Basically, don't drink coffee, green tea, or eat chocolate after you exercise or right after you break a fast. You want to do them while you're fasting, so you should exercise in a fastest day. You should consume those in a fastest state and then break the fast. Uh, coconut oil, totally good. Turbinata, raw sugar. Turbinata, raw sugar. It would be about two thirds of the way in the, to the right, like to, onto the reddish, orangish side of things. Basically, sugar itself is half fructose and half um, half sucrose. So it's sucrose. Um, it's, it's half dextrose and half fructose. That was supposed to say something else here. This is actually a mistake. Darn. Anyhow, um, raw stuff isn't that much better. The timing on the fasting. So your last meal of the day before you start your fast for the night is about one. So, so first of all, you don't have to do fasting or of any sort on the bulletproof diet. You can just eat all together. I don't want to mislead people. But the bulletproof intermittent fasting gives you some very big advantages, even if you do it once or twice a day. Sorry, once or twice a day, once or twice a week. <laughs> so in order to do that, what I do in the protocols is published on the site, is I eat my last meal of the day around 8 or 9 p.m. And then I don't have anything except fat and coffee, I eat bulletproof coffee in the morning, until 2 p.m. the next day. So 18 hours. It's an 18-hour yeah. fast. But it doesn't feel like a fast. Most people who do intermittent fasting get a little bit tired and cold and cranky, and they have work, and they have family, and they have stuff to do. But then they're like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force myself to make it. Well, if you have a big cup of coffee <laughs> with fat in it, none of that happens. You feel like a great golden god, and you get all the benefits of fasting. Like, it's awesome. That's the way to do it. Interesting. Can you repeat so, the question? The question was, MCT oil gives me a scratchy throat, and caffeine makes me jump up and down and go, ah. is that all right? All right. It turns out, I don't believe you about caffeine. I think that you've been drinking bad coffee, which does that. <laughs> How do you get caffeine to know that it does that to you? Because I stopped it. Because yeah, you stopped drinking bad coffee because it made you feel bad. That was bad coffee. That wasn't caffeine. I think you, you probably have a sensitivity to amines. It is the most likely thing there. And if you have a very low amine chocolate, I actually talk about brands of chocolate on the site. Lindt chocolate is very high turnover with European standards. It's one of the cleanest chocolates out there. Most of the American, even the organic brands, they don't have enough turnover, so those chocolates form microtoxins and amines. So chocolate and coffee can be not good for you, they can be good for you based on the quality of it. So I, I you know, if you want, try the bowl of your coffee. If it makes you feel tweaky, send it back to me, I'll give you your money back. Like I know hundreds of people who are like, I can't drink coffee, I can't have caffeine, it makes me feel bad, and then they drink that, and they're like, oh. So, so both of you, have you tried different brands of MCT? Okay, so my brand does it? With MCT? And PRP. I've never heard of this before. Has anyone else had I, I've heard of it. Yes. Yeah, you would, you would know. So the reason that it happens is that MCT oil is hyperfluid. It's very, very thin, and if the membranes in your throat are uh, susceptible, the fluidizing effect of the MCT is too strong. So there's a couple of things you can do. One is you can mix your MCT into coconut oil, which adds the long chain fats and, and uh, thickens it. Or you can do it with butter. Um, also, it may there may be some imbalance in the membranes that make you susceptible to this. And it may be that if you do a higher fat diet for a while that you become more tolerant of MCT oil. But my guess is at least 10% of people will have this kind of problem with MCT oil taken straight. At least 10%. Um, let's see, question back there. Yeah, can you please explain that mTOR pathway again? Is there a particular percent of the cacao and the dark chocolate that you like? Oh, oh uh, if you're trying to inhibit mTOR so that you'll build muscle, you need to have dark chocolate, 85, 90% dark. Otherwise, you're going to get a ton of sugar, which isn't so good for you, or milk, or whatever else they put in there that's not chocolate. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, uh, so it's all right to freeze, freeze meat? I mean, what's, I always always assume like freezing your food was bad. It, it turns out, this is, this is really counterintuitive, but repeat the question. Ah, sorry. If you, is it good to freeze your food or not? Freeze your meat, should you freeze it? 
when I bought this half of a cow, they were going to age it for 21 days. And, and I told them, no, no, bleed it out, chop it up, and freeze it, and I'll eat it. And it's really good that way. Dry-aged meat has a nice flavor, but they actually throw mold on the outside of it that sends hyphae through it, and it develops biogenic amines, and you lose 30% of the meat when they trim it off. So what we do now, even for non-aged meat in the US, is we package it sometimes six weeks ago in these big vacuum sealed things, and it forms biogenic amines. And sometimes they put carbon monoxide on it to make it look prettier so it develops a nice red color. But the idea that you need to have fresh meat is, is very expensive environmentally, and it's not beneficial. Frozen meat is going to be the least decomposed meat of all, and for God's sake, you're going to cook it. Like, why does it hurt that it was frozen if you're then going to cook it? Right? If you're going to eat it raw, you might make an argument there, but even then, sushi, we freeze sushi to kill parasites. So it's fine to freeze your meat. It's actually preferable to get meat that was frozen as soon as possible and defrosted right before you cooked it. That's going to have the least breakdown. What are you getting most of your calories when you had the 4,000 calorie diet? Fat. Just butter? <laughs> butter, MCT oil, animal flesh, and some vegetables. So just like two, three sticks of butter and then... <laughs> Smoked salmon, meat, two, three pounds of meat. By the way, if you're sleeping five hours a night, you're basically working, you know, as a senior executive, you move countries, you're under enormous amounts of stress, your brain uses 20 or 30% of what you're doing. If you stay up late, you burn more calories. And these fools say, oh, staying up late is bad because it means you eat more. Well, duh, <laughs> you're thinking more. You should eat more to support your brain function. If you're going to stay up late and not eat more, you're going to break your metabolism. That's bad. So the reason I ate so much is because I needed to be in a very high performance state to deal with the huge amount of stress that I was under. So you mentioned uh, smoked salmon. Was that cold smoke, hot smoke? <laughs> the best is cold smoke sockeye, the lowest toxin salmon that's out there. They don't get exposed to mercury very much. Hot smoked is generally okay, but cold smoke is slightly preferable. I'm going to do this side of the room, I'll be back. <laughs> I've heard and also seen supported on Tony Green Bean, which I've had my genetic profile done there, that um, there's this big argument around whether caffeine is good or bad for you, and there's been some research that suggested that it actually depends on uh, what sort of gene you have, and you may be one type of caffeine catalyzer versus another, depending on whether or not you have this gene. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that at all, since you say caffeine is actually good for you. One kind is called slow metabolizer. Yes. So on the question, I think I'll hear the question on the microphone. But basically, some people metabolize caffeine faster than others. And the question is, is, is coffee caffeine? It's not. Coffee itself has beneficial substances, a lot of them in it, that are not caffeine. It's just one of the alkaloids that's in it. So things like capistrol and cowahol have profound anti-inflammatory effects in the brain. So first of all, that's part of the equation versus like a caffeine pill. Um, second of all, even if you're a slow metabolizer of caffeine, you might want to have less caffeine. But I haven't seen the biochemistry to know whether those slow metabolizers break it down into something toxic, so I'm not sure the answer there. I love when people with actual knowledge answer. <laughs> um, research, some research shows that people who are slow metabolizers that have coffee is not a good thing for the longevity, whereas fast metabolizers it helps. I've heard of other research that coffee is both preventative and helps to cure Alzheimer's disease in plants. There's also the research that's also supported on plain breathing says that um, if you're one by um, up to two up to two cups of coffee or the equivalent of two cups of coffee or for caffeine is actually um, okay. And then if you're the other type, up to five or six cups is actually for you. And, and if you are the type that can take five to six, then it's actually a protective factor for your heart. But it's, it would be good to find out which kind you are if you mm -hmm. care. I do about two cups of coffee a day in the morning. I do it all in the morning so I don't sleep. There's some other studies on coffee. Uh, women who drink coffee end up um, with less depression. Um, it stops about 20% of prostate cancer incidents in men and 100% women. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know if you're a fast metabolizer, if you get a genetic profile done by 23andMe for what, 200 bucks? Is that what it sounds like? Yeah. Yeah. It's $299 for okay. Christmas time. And then they force you to take a $100 a year subscription, so it's $200. <laughs> so between one and $200 at 23andMe. <laughs> <laughs>